<laughs> well, something's wrong with the program or something because I have a red flashing light that somehow stays on flashing no matter what. So, unfortunately, I never know when it started. I do know when it ends. I walk out of the shot and then I go turn it off. <laughs> but, you know, I was, I gotta get over that saying, you know, it's gonna become like a Chuck Eye thing. And, you know, you know, you know, you know, who knows, who knows, I don't know. But, uh, you know, <laughs> oh well, we won't give it up. The uh, realization that I had in a very young age in the Lord was that I wasn't going to be successful. What? <laughs> well, that's the bottom line. It's going to be kind of a fun way to see what God's going to come out of this one because I'm like, well, Lord, <laughs> you want me to bring out all that garbage? You see, in my life as a Christian, because of my disability, meaning Crohn's disease, that was killing me, I wound up with a surgery that, uh, to put it quite bluntly, right here, I don't know if you can see it, <laughs> right here, hanging to about right there, is a bag. Now, it's not gross, at least maybe not to doctors, nurses, and maybe to other people, but for men, in my condition, whenever they received a ileostomy or a permanent bag, a lot of men got temporary bags called colostomies. And so what would happen with them is that they would go through this traumatic, oh, I'm no longer a man, almost as though they were castrated, no longer a man. And they had such humiliation that, uh, I don't know where they grew up, but <laughs> they had problems. But uh, they couldn't deal with it. So they would be like, like this, you know, and because it's a bag, that means that you no longer have bowel functions. You know, you know what bowel functions are. You know, when you when you get to be 50 onward, you know, they don't tell you this when you're 20. They don't tell you this when you're 30. As a matter of fact, I don't think they tell you this at all. But there's an old joke about, you know, kind of like, you know, you see these guys wandering around talking about, you know, Metamucil, and you see these stupid commercials on TV. When you get older... All them old folks, they're thrilled to have a bowel movement. <laughs> That's their joy. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> oh, I'm glad I'm not dealing with that one anymore. But you see, people that had these issues with their bowels, because they had such a poor self-esteem, or maybe they wrapped up their self-esteem in something else, Whenever they were given a surgery, like a colostomy or ileostomy, men couldn't handle it as well as women. So what they would do is they would kind of like stay back because you see this bag that basically right here is where my stoma is. It's kind of a bowel. You know, my bowel is taken from inside my guts. It's a gut that's pulled out and it's just kind of like yeet and then stapled to my skin or so. So that I have my... my bowel right there, and then it goes into a bag, and everything goes out. And unfortunately, never know when it's going out or when it's going to be there, so it's always there. Now, in that respect, that means every once in a while I have to go have a bowel movement, or for me, empty my bag. I'm Frodo Baggins. I'm one of Bilbo Baggins' relatives. By golly, I think I'm a relative of the Bagginses. But for me, I had no issue with that. The other issues I had was that because I had been and involved in poor self-esteem as a young man growing up and my family life was kind of different, when I felt so much love from God, I was overwhelmed by it. But I didn't know how the love of the brethren would be when they found out about me. Would woe well, me. I need to be loved, too, by other people. And so, I didn't know how to deal with, you know, Christians. You know, I could deal with God. God's love, oh, man, me and the Lord had a neat thing going. Boy, did we have a neat thing going. We were intimate. Ooh, dude. Dude, let me tell you, man, we had it. We got it. We like this. Hey, we got it like that. And you know what? 
I did. And God is real. And man, when I spend time with him, I mean, I can close my eyes and never mind. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Boy, is God real. And even when I'm open my eyes, <laughs> okay, put the ceiling back on, God. But other people I didn't know how to deal with because I was having these issues with my Crohn's disease and all these people were running around saying you had to be healed and you had sin in your life if you were sick and all these other things. You know, even though I was at Calvary Chapel, you know, there were people still running around behind the scenes, you know, and around the scenes that they really didn't know how to deal with handicapped people, you know. And the funny thing was, was that in my day, it wasn't like today where we have the ADA, you know, and all that kind of stuff, American Disability Act. That came about later. In my day, they were told, hide them off in the corner. Stick them out somewhere where they can't be seen. Don't let dis disabled people be known, because after all, we don't want them to... <laughs> they look horrible. And, you know, all the share movies hadn't come out with, you know, the kid with the messed up face, you know, and all these other things, you know. But rather, you know, things were still kind of like Archie Bunker Day. Kind of like almost the way sometimes it is about some people about Muslims, you know, they, they act like Archie Bunkers. But we won't go there right now. Or will we? But for me, because I had a bag on my side, sometimes I had accidents. And that meant that the bag might not be secured, so I would get, smell something, and it would be me. Oh, and that would just humiliate me. Or my bag would make a noise like a, a bifurcation, only people would think that it was a, I'm trying to think of the right word, fart! <laughs> that it was whatever the word is for that, I can't remember the word. <laughs> the technical medical term, you know, what we call it. What is that called? Come on, Lord, where we go here? Um, I can't think of it right now. I need some sugar. But the point being is that it would make gurgling noises, or it would make noises as though passing gas. And maybe in your household, or your neck of the woods, or your neighborhood, passing gas is a compliment of good food. <laughs> uh, okay, I think that's a burp. But when you're in a prayer meeting, when you're quiet before God, when everything is real silent, all of a sudden you hear this... <laughs> what do you do? You see, handicapped people or a person with a disability wants to be treated as normal. So they don't like to advertise the idea that they are handicapped because they're not. Because what's disabled in the world is enabled in Christ. But the point being is that they like to be treated as normal. They don't like to highlight their difference. They like to be part of the crowd. And the reality is, of course, they can't be. They can be normal to their normalcy, but other people are going to react, and they're going to act, and they're going to have preconceived notions. So, there is this kind of, when you're involved in Christian fellowship, do you suddenly want to get into the whole deal about, you know, yes, I've got Crohn's disease, yes, I wasn't healed, no, I don't have sin in my life, no, I don't do this, yes, I have that, no, I don't do this. And you really wanted to just get together and share Jesus, you know? And you really just wanted to be accepted, you know? And you really just wanted to be loved for who you are. And you can't be. Because, you see, you have a disease, and you have a disability, and you have something that's interfering between the fellowship you have with the brethren. And I'm not faking. It was part of my life. For 30 years, maybe 25 years of my life. Now, I used it as a means to go beyond, which is what most people do, my disability to make it an ability to reach over to others and to help them in some way. So I would take it as a tool and a means and I'd try to share with them. And everybody thought, oh, man, look at that guy. You know, he's talking about Crohn's. You know, he's so together about it. You know, he's so happy with who he is. You know, he's so assured and confident because he can talk about his disease and, you know, the surgery, you know, that he had and all that stuff and how God used it and how God ministers to other people and all that stuff. 
you know, that guy's really cool, you know, so little did they see me, but they saw the man that I wanted to be, because you see, the person still has feelings and emotions inside that doesn't have the ability to hide when you're forced out of the cocoon that you made for yourself. People in life do that. We all have our cocoons. We protect ourselves. We pull ourselves inside this little crystallosis and we keep weaving it and weaving it around and around and around and around. Making, if you don't know what a crystallosis is, it's a cocoon. <laughs> the crystallosis forms by weaving around, 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 and you just kind of You take this stuff and you just kind of spew it, you know, and you keep wrapping it around yourself and around yourself and around yourself till you're bound up, you know, and you're inside this cocoon. And the real you is inside, but outside there's this cocoon, crystallosis, that's forming. It starts off all nice and soft and pliable, but it winds up getting hardened and hardened, and then it winds up hanging you out to dry. And there you are inside. And the only thing people see isn't you, but this hardened shell on the outside of what you are on the inside. So for me, most of my life, while I was in my cocoon, I was always looking up to God and saying, God, why? Why, when I just got this job, I love this job. It's so much fun. I enjoy it. God, I'm having such a blast and now I'm sick. I'm dying. It's killing me. I don't want to lose this job. I want to keep it. God. And so you leave the job because you're dying and you can't keep the job. So then you put that on your resume. Well, you know, I was... Uh, Dying of Crohn's disease, so, you know, I think I got health now. I think I can do it. I think by faith, maybe, you know, that God is telling me I can go out and apply for work, you know, and work like a man, you know, because after all, you know, God said he supplied my needs, but hey, if you don't work for a living, you don't work, you don't eat. So let's get some self-esteem back. Let's work for a living. Let's, let's be a man about it. Let's toughen up. Let's do it. Let's be raw. Let's succeed. And in some ways, I did succeed. I always overachieved what the requirements of any job was. But after about a year, because it really wasn't where God wanted me to be, in my eyes, in my mind, in my heart, I failed. I felt like a failure. Because I couldn't show my mother, I couldn't show my friends, I couldn't show my spouse, or spouses at the time, whichever one, spouse, that I could succeed in what I wanted to be. So, recovering from that, I would move on to another job, to another situation, to another circumstance where God would use it and let me be a part of it. And I learned from it, oh look, I'm learning about this job, or that job, and suddenly I had to go and get healthy again, and then go back to another job, and another, and another, and another, and another. And so, humorously, jack of all trades, master and none, only I mastered all of them, and it seems like I succeeded in everything. So, God took the twisted of my illness and was proving a success, but what I saw in my crystallosis in the hardened shell of my understanding as I hung there by life, barely a string to keep me alive, as I wove and wove inside my crystallis, keeping me deep inside, as this worm caterpillar of a man, boy, who had been given so much of God to start with, with the knowledge of the wisdom of God, and all that God was, and all the Word of God poured out inside of them. I hardened 
all the outer shell by the words failure that I saw written on the inside of my chrysalis. For all I saw was failure. And I would read and I'd study and I'd say, no, I'm not a failure. I'm, God is working out His will. It will work out. It'll be accomplished. And then at moments of bright lights, you know, where, oh, the worm would suddenly feel something. Oh, something's changing. Ah, I would discover, oh, you know what? That uh, experience I can take and use for someone else's ministry. I could, I could take this, what I learned here, and I could make it work over there. Oh, maybe that was why I went through that. Maybe I experienced that in order to accomplish his purpose. Oh, oh, oh wow. That deformity is being made conformable to his will so that I could use my failure for his success. Oh, man, something's happening. It's changing me. I'm, I'm becoming more sensitive to people. You know, I I know what it's like for the uglies of the world to be rejected and despise the people. I know what it's like to be hated, to be rejected, to not have a job, to have a job, to lose a job, to keep a job. Oh, I know what it's like for my my entire being to be wrapped up in my self-esteem and my job. God, free me! And behold, in the fullness of time, when it is time, the crystallisis sheds itself. You bust yourself out of that which you were, the worm that you were, O Jacob, and you become the butterfly of God. You become what he created you to be, free. You are that man of God you always wanted to be and that woman that you were meant to be. Because nothing of your circumstances, of your life, ever stopped God from working in you to accomplish his purpose, to make you completely perfect for his will, his way, and his word to be accomplished in you. There is nothing that is not being done for you. There is nothing that's not being done to you. You are accomplishing His will. You are a child of God. You are a worm inside the chrysalis that is being conformed into the image of God and you will break forth and be free like a butterfly. Oh tadpole that you are. Oh little minnow swimming in a pond scum. Will you not come out of the water and get up on a lily pad? Will you not be a bullfrog? Will you not allow us all to see what God has created you to be? So for me, most of my life, and really up until Oh, I don't know. Probably about 40 when I finally said, you know, I really don't care what anybody thinks. <laughs> I kind of see my life as a success, you know. And now that the economy, you know, sucks at this year, you know, these last few years, I kind of go, hey, look at all those people. They have to change their jobs. <laughs> I've been doing that all my life. Of course, now that God has taken me out of the realization of the failure that I had written on the inside of chrysalis, I see on the outside as that is cast down on the ground, the purpose of my failing was the success of God. For he had changed me and made me into the image that he wanted me to be, which was a butterfly free. That I could be a delight to those around me if I chose to fly. If I chose to be what I was meant to be. To reach out to reach up, to reach with the heart that I've been given by the pain that I felt, by the experiences I went through. Because a butterfly knows what he is. That butterfly, he is just enjoying going from here to there and flying everywhere. Because you know what? He remembers when he was crawling along on that leaf 
He remembers when he was crawling on the ground. Matter of fact, he remembers when he was just like getting into that little crystallosis and just creating a shell of what he was looking like he was until he became what he was meant to be. God intends for you to be real simple, real easy to understand. How you get there is according to his plan. But he's meant for you to have peace in the world. Peace that passes all understanding that when the world is falling apart and everyone around you says, what are we going to do? You go, well, I don't know about you, but I think I'll trust in the Lord. But what about the political parties, man? we got to figure out who to vote for. What are you going to do? Well, <laughs> yeah, I'm really not worried about it. <laughs> I'm just going to trust in the Lord. Well, I mean, you know, look at the world. It's falling apart. You know, families are broken up. You know, people are losing their minds. They're losing their money. They're losing their gold. They don't know where to go. What are you going to do? Well, <laughs> you know... I don't know how to explain it, but I kind of I kind of feel peaceful about it. I'm just going to trust in the Lord, you know, because <laughs> what else am I going to do, really? You know, and that peace that passes all understanding will rule your heart and mind as he develops it in you. Because that's what a butterfly does when it's free. It doesn't worry about the cares of the world, now does it? It's not worried that it once was a chrysalis and a worm and a caterpillar crawling along. Doesn't worry about how to crawl. Learn how to fly. Oh, but let's go for the joy, or let's go for the love, or the meekness, or the kindness, or the gentleness. Oh, so how do we get those? You want the truth? Never ask, never answer that one if I ask you it. Because if I ask you, do you really want to know? You really don't want to know. But as a man of God, and I am, as a man with God, such as I am, as a man forgiven by God, as I have been, as a man who loves God, as I do, and as a man God loves, as he's chosen to, then I can tell you this. You may not like the process and at times you may not feel like a Christian. You may not feel like rejoicing. You may not feel like you're loved. Lord, give us thy joy. That joy that no man, no poverty, no circumstance, and no condition can take away from us. You shall have my joy. But life just now, for you, is a march. A toilsome march. A caterpillar's crawl. A weaving of a crystallosis. The joy will come, but for the moment, don't think of that. Think simply of the march. Think simply of walking. Think simply of talking. Think simply of being with me. If you do, joy is the reward. Between my promise of the gift of joy to my disciples and the realization of that joy came a sense of failure. Disappointment. Denial. Desertion. Hopelessness. Then hope. And then waiting. And then courage in the face of danger in the very crystallosis of life that it is doing to you as God is working in you, the cocoon he has created. Joy is the reward of patiently seeking me in the dull, dark days of trusting when you cannot see. 
Joy is, as it were, your heart's response to my smile of recognition of your faithfulness to endure even when you come to the wrong conclusions and you feel ugly. And in your chrysalis you have written failure. And in your mirror you have seen liar, thief, sinner, no good, abuser, loser, unacceptable, disabled. And on the inside you can only see those things that you've heard, that you've been told and that you've written on the cocoon inside you're being transformed as God works on you even using those things that were so contorted from the world telling you all the things that the world thinks about you as God is taking that contortion and that deformity and making it into what? Beauty. For behold, Jesus said, I make all things new. Stop thinking your lives is all wrong. Remember, you may not be joyous yet, but if you are brave, and if you are courage and unselfish, and you think of others, and you care about them, and you take that deformity that you have, that unusual kind of twisting that God does in order to change you, and rearrange you and reach out to others who are going through the same process and tell them that what they think they know as they're in their little chrysalis looking at only what they have written with their own experiences of life that they're going to become a butterfly free then I think you're going to see something interesting. You might meet someone like me. Someone who, the very beginning of his salvation, always heard God speak to him. Always had a personal relationship with him, even when he failed and when he fell down and when he was being beat up and stomped on and kicked around and just confused, abused and used. <laughs> You'll probably meet someone like me because you're becoming someone you are and we're both the same. There's nothing in me any greater or any lesser than you are. And surprise, surprise, there's nothing different between you and I than Billy Graham, Greg Laurie, Chuck Smith, Rick Warren, Joyce Myers, Kay Arthur, I'm trying to think of everybody I can think of. I can't think of everybody off the top of my head. Zola Levin, you know, who knows? Pick a name! Pick a theme! There's no difference. No difference. We were all worms, O oh Jacob, but I will make you to become a butterfly. And you will be set free. Whom the Son has made free, he is free indeed. All you need to do is learn how to fly. And can I tell you a little secret? Even in my chrysalis is all conformed and deformed, I could still take my two fingers and I could still make a butterfly. In your trials and tribulations as you're going through them, if you see by way of God telling you what you will be, then you'll be willing to go through the process. And the day I got saved, I made this declaration. It's scary, but it's true. I said, I can't wait to get old. Maybe I'm not a butterfly. Maybe I don't float like a butterfly and sting like a bee. At least not what you see. But what God sees, and where I've been, with Him. It is a joy 
to know God will finish the work he's begun in you and he's begun with you and he has made you his craftsmanship, his workmanship, not just created for good works, but created because you are his work. You are his butterfly set free. And you get to fly. And if you know anything about the life of a butterfly, man, do you get to enjoy basking in his sunlight. <clears throat> Don't worry if you're just a worm right now. You might be a crystallicist, you know. Just a little bit more. And you'll be there.